A word to the wise, we are an explicit podcast tackling choicey adult themes as well as entering spoiler territory if you aren't caught up with us. Today we are beginning the first half of part two, Rage in Morningstar, which is the end of a trilogy of books by Pierce Brown. Catch up with us quick if you haven't already. We'd love to uh, to have to be in your ear holes. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hey there, this is Cross. And I'm PJ. And we are Words and Whiskey, a podcast for veteran and novice readers alike. We tackle fiction novels and love to talk about what we're drinking. Think of us as your drunk weekly book club. This week, I'm going to be honest with you guys, I... We took a long time going through our show notes ahead of time, so I've already consumed my cocktail. So, uh, I will talk about what I drank, but I'm having something else entirely, which I'll talk about as well. Yeah, so today is our long third episode covering Morningstar by Pierce Brown, and we are here to discuss the first half of Part 2 Rage, covering chapters 13 through 19. Me saying it's long on the front end, it feels like I just like cursed us to an extra long episode, even though we haven't recorded the rest of the episode. Or we're going to breeze through it in like 20 minutes. Yeah, we'll we'll see which one it is. I'm it's going not going to be the first. It's, it's not, not going to be, be twenty minutes. <laughs> it's not going to be twenty minutes. <laughs> we ended up talking about this for an hour and a half before we even started. Yeah. So, uh, what are you having? So, what I had, <laughs> I mean, uh, the fact that it's already gone is kind of a testament to how delicious it was. It's a cocktail that I've had on the show with a little bit of a twist. So, uh, one of my favorite cocktails, New York sour. So, uh, whiskey sour with a float of dry red wine on top. But this time I d- used uh, rosemary simple syrup, which I made last week, I think, or two weeks ago and used in last week's episode and a sprig of rosemary along with the lemon wedge that's typical. And then I used a petite Syrah from uh, Michael David, Sixth Sense 2017. It was <laughs> it was really fucking good. So that wine is actually what I'm drinking now just on its own. Nice. Did did you have a beer to follow it up with? I do and uh we decided on doing some sours you and i so i've got yeah puff tart xl which is a series of beers from the brewing project out of wisconsin this one is peach mango and plum Ooh. so uh i am also having it should be said that we are actually having all sours all night except for your wine <laughs> now uh i am also yeah. having a whiskey sour Without the rosemary and without the the float, it's just a straight up whiskey sour as you'd expect it. Lemon, egg white, shaken. Pretty good. Nice. Um, definitely enjoying it. And then to follow that up, I have Evergreen Brewing's Sorbetto Number no. Twenty Five, which is a sour ale with blueberry, black currant, plum, vanilla, and marshmallow. Nice. It is oh yeah, so good. This also has marshmallow in it. <laughs> yes. You know, so I'm just gonna crack that open right now and enjoy a little sippy poo. Mm. Ah, delicious all right man that's so fucking good so with that let's go into last week's predictions yes indeed we should so you asked me what what was going to come next and i said training montage and i think i pretty much nailed it oh i think i think you're skipping skipping a little smidgen here pj we've got a deadpool coming to knock in first uh, before we get into what you actually predicted last week, we have to talk about your prediction you made on the front end of this episode. And that I is that one of our characters that. died. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm for my up. half shot. Uh, Moira, which y- you had predicted that she would live through this book, has died. Rip Moira. Rip Moira. But I mean, maybe she'll go the way of like, I don't know, Narrow and Darrow and countless other characters that don't actually end up being dead. I mean, Narrow was never confirmed dead. It was all a rumor. Yeah, but Darrow, Darrow believed it. Yeah, I mean, Darrow's a gullible shithead. All right. What are what are you uh, shooting? Rekia. 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 Fair. Icelandic vodka. The best. And the best. It, it feels like such a dumb gimmick to have like volcanic rock filtration but it gives it this minerality that's just so good i love yeah, this vodka it actually feels like you're drinking ice water instead of vodka for some reason and it's ridiculous i mean sometimes 
Yeah, right, right. It's still vodka. It not is, discounting. It's definitely still vodka, but yes, right. it is It is one of the smoother vodkas I've ever had. Interestingly enough, have you ever seen that like alien head vodka? Yes, we bought it once and drank we it did. together. You we and drank. I drank it together. Yes. Very similar to Reikia. Very similar. Not as good. Not as good, but um, I'm, I'm thinking they go through a similar like uh, filtration yeah. process. Agreed. Also, I'm just going to go ahead and... Uh, ratchet it up a little bit because otherwise i'd have like a quarter shot of vodka left in this bottle so i've got a three-quarter shot instead of nice nice cheers 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 and sadness here goes the rest of this episode pj already has his drink done and one and three quarters shots down the hatch Mm -hmm. here goes Mm -hmm. oh yeah on fire if if we (laughs) haven't mentioned it before crossland and i take a shot before uh before every episode recording yeah, no, I think we've definitely talked about it oh, a couple of times. I think like, we have. Wow. Back to the predictions, though. What do you think comes next? You said a training montage uh, mm-hmm. with Ragnar round two with Victra. I am going to take the drink for that. You were mostly correct. We did immediately open into a training montage. Ragnar, whatever, was not there, but that's fine. He ended up being there for a little while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, when he shows him up with the uh, with the deadlifts. Mm hmm. That's that's a fair point. Just slaps on so much weight that it's insulting to the two of them. Until there's not space to put on more weights. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So we move on. Uh, Mustang's reaction. She blows it off. You said she blows it off. Doesn't respond positively or negatively. And I don't know where we stand on this. I think. How do, how do I you feel? Th- I think I'm right. But I think it'd be disingenuine to actually take that as the resolution I don't think they had much time to do anything otherwise. So, you know. Okay, so we'll call it a skip and we'll leave it in the list and come back to it. But later. Yeah, we'll, we'll wait until she actually has an opportunity to respond to it. Mm-hmm. That's fair. Definitely. Okay, moving on to the next one. How's Darrow going to recover? <laughs> Which you answered the exact same thing. <laughs> so that's... Yeah. Uh, mm. I also drink. I think it's essentially the same... <sighs> question as the first one but if you already drank you know no i think they were asked over two different weeks though they which were. is why i think you're right yeah, <laughs> they were yeah why why i'm drinking that one so as it goes mm-hmm. with that let's get into the chapters so we've got chapter 13 right off the bat howlers it's important to note actually that part two starts with a very very important severo quote which is shit escalates shit escalates Which is kind of the brand that is spun off of this. It is very much Pierce Brown has adopted that phrase as his own in in every which way. (laughs) And so is a lot of the fandom and whatnot. So that's one of those phrases that gets thrown around a lot is shit escalates. The legit web store for all of the merchandise for Red Rising is (laughs) shit-escalates.com. Yeah, it's it's great. Any any read on that quote? I mean, shit's escalating. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know what other read there can be. <laughs> I mean, there could be alternate reads. I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. Do you have an alternate read, Crossland? No, that's that's definitely the read I got. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we'll move into chapter 13, Howlers. So as we mentioned a bit ago, you uh, you got me here. A, wa- a workout montage begins this section. It's pretty fantastic, like you mentioned. Just great that Ragnar shows up and shows shows off. They talk briefly about being recarved or reanimated. Basically, very very interesting. Indeed, in there, there's there's some good, really fun interactions with Ragnar. I, I liked. I I mean, like we just mentioned, him putting up all the weight and. Just kind of doing it. And mm-hmm. then his silent sort of nod to them and gesturing them to do the same. And they fucking can't because they're, I don't know, not obsidians. Yeah, not insanely massive human beings. Just ridiculously oh, oversized. That's, a, that's another point that I don't think I I don't think got mentioned previously. Mm-hmm. What What is the like species name of humanity right now? Because it's not homo, homo sapiens anymore. Uh, well, it, as as a means of demeaning reds, mm-hmm. the jackal called them something else, 
which was just a slight step above Homo sapiens. Yes. So I, if I remember correctly, I feel like it's Homo orate or, or oratus or something like that is the mention. I honestly, I don't perfectly remember, but it's something in that realm. Okay. And they're referred to as kind of that, that sort of upper echelon. Homo orate is what it is. So yeah, I, I mean, there's clearly some differentiation and I'm assuming among all of the different I feel like that was really only made a point more by the board of quality control and by the jackal less something that everyone strictly believes, although they do also have obvious genetic mutations. Right. Right. So, you know, there's there's some there's some questions there, but everyone should be treated like a human regardless. So, well, yeah, dun dun. <laughs> but does that make them still humans? I mean, yeah. Baseline, I think. That's that's kind of the point. That's that's the whole point of the series. So basically. so I guess in that respect, is Homo erectus still a human? Great question. Do you know any Homo erectuses? We no. could ask. <laughs> oh well, I mean, well then we can't ask. Bingham, maybe. So I don't. <laughs> Speaking of uh, no wheels, McGee stream on Twitch. Yada yada yada. Yeah, no, I I don't. I don't know and I don't feel like I feel like the separation is artificially generated in the first place by the golds genetically mutating them to create the society caste system. So while they may exist, a lot of it's artificial. And I guess a question would remain where if they continued to breed in the way that they do, would they continue down the evolutionary path or would they reunite in kind of a interesting more homogeneous genius genius? Yeah. Interesting. Anyway, sorry that I, I started thinking about that a lot more after recording and was kind of kicking myself for not bringing it up. But it's a it's a fair point. I mean, it's a it's a good good bit, but it's definitely a larger question that I think would be answered in some sort of oeuvre commentary that we, I guess, get to create. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I use the word oeuvre in the podcast, so I win. <laughs> <laughs> Darrow and Victor find themselves recovering in a different combat unit called the Pit Vipers. What do you think of the Pit Vipers and the whole strategy of getting them back in action? So I wish there was more. Uh, I wish it was kind of fleshed out a little bit more because Narrell is the one leading it. Mm-hmm. And I would have loved to see what he was like as a squad leader. <laughs> and we didn't really yeah. get to see it at all. Yeah, and maybe we be... will going forward, but not from Darrow's perspective directly. True true i think you'd be a soddy old jerk right well i mean who's not yeah that's at fair. this point <laughs> <laughs> everyone's just mean and jaded perpetually inside the red rising universe i mean it's not wrong no that's i mean that's a fair point everyone's been thoroughly mistreated i mean mustang at this point it's got to be like it's probably the jackal darrow is probably the jackal am i right i think so hmm. that's her paranoia talking interesting yeah hmm, that'd be that'd be fucked up Right. Flesh masks. She saw him executed. You know, this is not something that I thought that I was going to bring up right now or at all during the episode. But here we are. <laughs> so um, I think the rest of this chapter is really kind of the fascinating bit because you kind of you kind of begged and asked for this to the Pierce Brown gods. And I knew that it was coming. And I was so excited that you got to kind of see the uh, the Howler induction ceremony. But before we get to that, what did you think of the actual abduction scene before? Like oh, when when man. they're getting bagged? Like I was so stressed on this. Reunion. It was it was every emotion that I could think of. Like it was back and forth all the entirely like there's no way. How did the Jackal figure this out? Why would he choose to abduct Darrow and Victra in the showers like this? Like mm-hmm. the. It was back and forth a lot between like, well, this is interesting. This is fucking terrifying. This doesn't make sense. Who is this? Yeah. Um, So I'm glad it didn't get. I'm glad you didn't choose for this to be the cliffhanger (laughs) from last week, except for it would have been in the middle of a page, you know, like it would have been. It would have been like, oh, yeah, don't read past paragraph four (laughs) in chapter 13 or whatever. I also immediately when the robotic voice started playing and he or started speaking and he like knew who it was, I genuinely thought it was Orion hmm. for like a for for what it is. What is it? A couple lines mm-hmm. where yeah. it's not revealed. Like, I really thought it was Orion for a second there, which would have been interesting. 
Yeah, it definitely would have been an interesting abduction, you know, to consider the the alternate universe in which Orion is pulling this off. You know, could could happen. Yeah, but I mean, she's she's so counter to who blues are in general Mm -hmm. that it's believable that she could do something like that. Yeah, very true. Very true. We thought she was dead, too. I mean, at the very least, Darrow thought she might be dead. Right. We figure out later that that's not true. Anyway, uh, I really like the quote. Do not profane this moment from Ragnar in the middle of kind of this this whole right before the induction into the Howlers, the hazing ritual. Mm -hmm. Anything that stood out to you as particularly disgusting or uh, repulsive or what do you think of the whole hazing? I I guess I want to back up a little bit and talk about that moment with Ragnar and that that quote. He is a man who is so defined by his beliefs Mm-hmm. And now that his his understanding of what the world is and how it operates and who golds are and everything has been completely shattered, he has taken on the howlers and their sort of traditions and lore as sacred beyond anything else. And it's really, really cool to see him sort of shift that sort of part of his brain that devotes to lore. To something entirely different very true i i do not disagree in the slightest i think that it is a fantastic read on that is that this is he takes the oath later that's asked as this first family thing incredibly seriously i would say he he considers it maybe second to his stains that he's given darrow right now you know like he still considers darrow and darrow's priorities to be absolute number one mm-hmm. but i think The howlers are just as important for that same reason. You know, he takes faith in general very seriously. Right. That's a great read. But as far as particularly disgusting goes, um, this is kind of a little bit of payoff on what was mentioned. Was it was it even last book? It might have been Red Rising. I can't remember. I, I think it was the beginning of Golden Sun. Okay. Or somewhere in the middle of Golden Sun. Because I believe it was a new batch of Howlers getting inducted with mushrooms and other things like that. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's the thing. Is we still don't know about the mushrooms unless that was part of the cocktail that was... Well, no. Mm-hmm. It, it says alcohol, mushrooms, and snakes. Mm-hmm. So we've got the alcohol and the snakes, but not necessarily the mushrooms yet. But we got cockroaches Wait, you remember instead. what was in the old? Hmm? Yeah. You remember what was in the last book? Nice. Okay, well done. Yeah, it, it said... I remember, I, I know it involves alcohol, mushrooms, and snakes. Mm-hmm. Good call. Um, no, I'm just proud of you. That's that's it. That's all. <laughs> I don't remember a whole let, lot, but when I remember stuff, I remember it pretty well. Let this little bean pod dad be proud of you, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bean dad. It's been so long. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I initially thought that they brought out three buckets. Mm-hmm. So there were three three pit vipers, and mm-hmm. after Harmony took a bite of the pit viper, like killed the Holiday. pit viper, I'm doing it now too. <laughs> now I can't see, make fun of it. you guys. <laughs> um, I'm doing it now too. Anyway, after Holiday beats the thing to death and takes a bite out of it, Victra immediately stuck her hand into the bucket, and I thought it was a different bucket with another pit viper, and I Ooh. thought she was going to get bit. Fair. But, I mean, this was a straight-up episode of Fear Factor. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay. Sans Joe Rogan. Sans Joe Rogan. Uh, maybe that would have... I don't know. Would that have made it better or worse? I'm not sure I, at this point. I don't know. <laughs> it's very unclear. It would, it's shocking that there's no mushrooms if Joe Rogan's not there. But. That's true. He would have made sure that happened. <laughs> <You know? laughs> pretty, pretty sure that would have happened. Now, I, I really... I really do like kind of the hazing ritual and the whole thing going on uh, with the howlers and especially the comments that you made about the first family, second family thing. I think that that's really important and kind of looking at that idea. Uh, what other did you have any other thoughts on the whole placing the howlers first over your real blood family? I mean, it all I all it made me think of is Christianity and like Catholicism and like God mm. comes first. Well, I mean, OK, but why? <laughs> That's that's, that's kind of where it came from for me. You know, that's, like I, that's I, I'm fine with people putting that much like importance on faith, but it's it's always struck me as weird. 
I, I don't disagree with you at all. What I actually see it as instead is, and I, I definitely understand where you're coming from with that. I think that I see it instead as Severo not having a family. And so he's effectively created one to replace a mom that was never there, really. And then a dad who was also absent. And yeah. so he's effectively created this like loner group of wolves and he kind of wants everyone to be like him. Yeah. And Which it's, a, it, yeah. it's that's that's unfair, I think. I think it's really unfair and kind of whether or not it was done for like pure reasons. It's it seems like a really kind of harshly unfair rule to have in place. Do you think that there's any validity or do you think they'll stand by it long term? Do you I see don't that think Daryl broken? Darrow's already gone through so much torture and so much so much pain that could have been completely avoided by just giving up his family. Mm-hmm. I, I think it'd be for him to so casually do this. Mm-hmm. I think one probably says a lot about how he feels about the howlers in general. Mm-hmm. I think um, I think he he loves them unconditionally. Mm -hmm. But I think it also says something about his intentions a little bit long term. And I don't think he necessarily intends to be in the ranks of the howlers forever. Interesting. I think he I think he in his mind, at least, intends to be sort of back in the back in the throne, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. No, I I definitely think that that's a thing and that I, I think that being among you know, let's let's treat it Arthurian a little bit. Being among like your knights is one thing and being like adopted into the group when you were, in fact, the original one of the heads of the Howlers to begin with is is interesting. Although he was kind of always separate, even in Red Rising. Yeah, he was. I don't he never even started. He didn't create the Howlers. Severo did. Yeah, they followed Darrow, but Severo is the one that organized it and named it right. and created it. Right. It's always been Severo. <laughs> Definitely, definitely agree with you. Acting I, I, on behalf of Darrow, but never yeah. Darrow directly. So we move on from there to chapter 14, The Vampire Moon. I love the description of Phobos that we get right away on uh, on 103. It's so small for a moon. You know, it, it got me thinking <laughs> into like all the, all of, all of the like planetary bodies that are out there. And it's crazy how I've just like taken for like granted the size of our moon. It's the fifth largest planet. It's like almost or fifth largest uh, non planetary body. body. Yeah. Which is nuts. Celestial like is, body, I guess. No, not, not yeah, non planetary. It's larger than I believe it's larger. Maybe it's not larger than Pluto, but it's larger than a uh, several dwarf planets that are inside of our area. Uh, it's, I think it's bigger than Pluto. I think it is bigger than Pluto. It's it's nuts to think about the moon that way, though, you know, like, yeah. It is bigger than Pluto by 300 miles on the radius, which is That's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, OK, moon, think about that. Yeah. Our moon is bigger than Pluto by a radius of 300 miles. Yeah. The radius of Phobos is less than two miles total. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like this is it's so small. Not less than two, less than six right? kilometers. Yeah. 5K is three miles. Three, yeah. So six miles, right? What? A five K. Five K miles is three miles. So yep, twelve kilometers. Twelve kilometers is like twelve K. Would be yeah. Six, it's probably seven, yeah eight ish. Six 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 and a half ish probably. Yeah, closer to seven. But yeah, so it's it's small. Like it's tiny. I've got to look so this up. Tiny. Give me a second. Uh, yeah, we we did a lot of math. Uh, we did do a lot of math going forward. Start talking about that. Yeah. So one of the things that I found really interesting is uh, we, we were looking this up and we were talking about the radius and we got fascinated. This is part of what we talked about for so long before the podcast. The surface area of Phobos is about one point two five times that of New York City with about three and a half times as many people because it's got 30 million people on that moon, according to the text itself. So we're basically saying take a little bit larger than New York City, stack three and a half times as many people on top and uh, and you've got a Martian moon. So, OK, first of all, seven and a half miles would be the radius yeah. of focus. Okay. That said, <laughs> if you think that's crowded, Tokyo is about half the surface area of Phobos 
and has 8 million more people. <laughs> Which is nuts. <laughs> nuts. Is yeah. that insane? There's so many it's, people in Tokyo. 38 it's million. It's, it's absolutely insane how many people. It should be noted that that's also the surrounding area. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, I just, so new... Okay. Newark, New York, so including Newark, uh, it's 18.6. You know, it's it's more, but that would be including Newark. Newark is a larger, a much, it would add a lot of a metropolitan area to New York, at which point it's it would be, you know, about size to size, 18 million, so it'd be an extra 12. But yeah, Tokyo still okay. 38, like that's... So Tokyo itself is 9.2 or 9.3. Yeah. So never mind. But it's half the size still. Your your point to some yeah. degree still stands. Yeah. It's half the size of New York. It's got an extra 1.1 million people. It scales like crazy. Yeah. Basically, what we're saying is, yeah, in a sci-fi universe, you could totally stack people. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. it would totally happen on that moon. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's crazy to me. I'd, I'd taken it for granted that like every planet had a moon that was similar and not a strange bunch of misshapen rocks. What's crazier yet is that Deimos, the other moon is smaller. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's, uh, that's just earth has a second moon, doesn't it? Technically. Yes. So it's not, it, it is an by orbital definition. Body. It's a moon, I think. Yes. But I think it's an orbital body. So I don't think by definition, it's not okay. a moon. Um, but it does revolve around the Earth's orbit. It's called Kurathene. One of my favorite sci-fi story series is written around it. Yeah. We yes. Should, we should make our next uh, expedition instead instead of to the moon. We should go to uh, Kurathene. Kurathene. Yeah, there's there's an interesting time portal on Kurathene that you can access that will allow for you to travel <laughs> multidimensionally. Not in, not in this world. Are you sure? <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> I guess I'm not. I can't. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, I can't tell. speaking of speaking of like real world expeditions, um, this coming Thursday, I believe it's actually going to be the past Thursday, PJ. If you think okay. about it, last Thursday from when this is published, but this coming Thursday from when we're recording it, NASA is going to be live streaming a rover landing. <laughs> hmm. I'm so fucking excited. <laughs> yeah it it'll be it'll be it'll be fun cool i'm going to be working at the time but i'm still going to be pulling up the live stream and uh crossland if you're around we should uh put together a little watch party or something <laughs> yeah and thursday i'll i'll do that curathene for everyone's knowledge because i'm still here obsessed on uh diameters meters radius of various orbital bodies is uh five kilometers in diameter <laughs> <laughs> so it's three you could run a 5k around that sucker <laughs> four times pi times 2.5 squared here we are talking about moons the surface area is 78.5 square kilometers or miles nice. did you say kilometers or miles uh so it was five kilometers okay yeah so 78 and a half square kilometers <laughs> so nothing yeah very tiny, tiny very little tiny. little, tiny. little town on kurathene or a interdimensional portal one or the other uh, so if the rumors of a moaning uh, moving into the rest of this chapter the vampire moon is very interesting the whole concept of phobos being named after fear is explicitly explained so it doesn't feel like it's necessary to get into that it's within that first little section of the book what I find really interesting is moving into the rest of this chapter. We get kind of the whispers of Quicksilver, who we end up seeing nearer to the end of the chapter. But what did you think of our introduction to our first Silver and the place that Silvers actually hold in society now that we've kind of seen and experienced them? They they just kind of seemed like, I don't know, what would it be? Economic sector busybodies is kind <laughs> of the way it was seen. Mm hmm. I, I don't know a better way to describe it than that. It's fair. It's fair. Like, it reminded me of the New York Stock Exchange like, floor when they described all the the bustling silvers working like bees. Mm -hmm. Running around, screaming, no doubt, trading things for seemingly no reason for infinitesimal, least small amounts of gain. Sick gains, Chad. <clears throat> so... With that, if you had to cast someone 
as Rolo, who were introduced here as this roguish type. Who would you cast? I have an answer and you're going to hate it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Am I? Am I going to okay. hate it? I'm yes. not pleased already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's, let's go through what the way they describe him. Stringy and rye with sparkling bright eyes and a goatee. Okay. Think about this as well. Fairly near the surface of Mars. It's Fairly Jared Leto. Near. Oh, no. <laughs> no. He's roughly 30 uh, seconds from Mars. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Bright eyed, skinny actor man. I am. I am so upset. <laughs> He is a bright, skinny-eyed actor man who is also a cult leader and it's important to not endorse the cult of Jared Leto, although I do love him in Mr. Nobody. Mr. No- I just I just rewatched it. I fucking love that movie. And a couple of other movies, but still. I watched it with Kayla and she hated it. She hated, she couldn't finish it. She hated the oh, movie. Man. Well, it's a it's it's not an easy pill to swallow. No. I also, to be fair, I didn't realize this. I bought the director's edition or director's cut of the movie. No, oh, is there? There's a longer cut. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. I'll have to get it. It's really inter- like it's really good. There's there's quite a bit more. I think you'd get a lot more out of it. Honestly, cool. Yeah. I'll definitely give it a go. It's a uh, it's interesting because I think it leads to a kind of a similar societal point to some degree yeah. <laughs> so but i mean seriously jared leto <laughs> as rollo as really Rolo. interesting God, God damn it. <laughs> just this is like how many does he have all his limbs i think he had all of his limbs okay but his co-workers didn't uh, it would be fun to see jared leto hack off a limb for <laughs> some method acting though <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd be into that and complaining the shit about julia industries yeah right which which is also interesting you know it's ob- it's got to be antonia's company at this point right because she murdered her mom well, it's, considering that's a, victor that's a hostile takeover victor antonia murdering about- her mom is a hostile yeah. takeover yeah, yeah i will yeah. not let my joke be silenced <laughs> i mean damn it yeah is it is it really hostile if the if i mean the other person's murder. dead yeah, it's it's double murder actually, because you know Victra in theory would be dead as well. It is it is ultimately funny though that Victra is here meeting him, who you know I think it's also kind of like humanizing to some degree for her. Oh, it's you know, in an it's indirect in, way. like crazy sobering. Yeah, like it's, even for Darrow, not mm-hmm. even considering the cost of of uh, Carver's, like mm-hmm. didn't even cross his mind when he asked about it. And, I I felt like it came across as a little bit embarrassed when he was like kind of shown up, not shown up, but uh, faced with the fact that like that's way more expensive than prosthetics are. Yeah. Not everyone is worth that amount of money. Well, there's that, too. Yeah. But. Well, and can afford it. You know, that was kind of my point is that like prosthetics are cheaper. It's not like you're just going to go out and get a, a carved limb, you know. Mm-hmm. But I mean, they're not even seen as worth having good prosthetics mm-hmm. yeah well, like company good pays for shitty ones, ones. <laughs> like which i imagine as like metal arm well yeah i imagine mm-hmm. shitty prosthetics as like similar to like if, if you were to draw a perfect comparison and i am calling it a perfect comparison it's like george washington's wooden teeth mm. compared to like <laughs> crowns Fair, fair, yeah. <laughs> so no, I'm, teeth, I'm imagining like literal two by fours people. with a hinge in the middle as an arm. Yeah, I mean, if if they if the wooden teeth were real and weren't teeth that were actually harvested from people, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's <laughs> yeah. true. Right, right. That's no, way I, more I totally hardcore. Agree. That's yeah. way more badass. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds like something an obsidian would do. But uh, you know, mm, it sounds like a thing the Ooh. jackal would do if needed. Fair. Man, fair point. Evil dude. Okay, so chapter 15, The Hunt. I find it wonderful that they're in a trash compactor. You know, I can't help. <laughs> and I know that we, you reminded me that we set up this rule where any sci-fi references that the other one catches, the other one has to drink if we miss them. I don't think that this is a direct ode to Star Wars, but I can't help but think about the trash compactor in Star Wars. Right. Um, and there, this isn't the only one that falls into that category. The mm-hmm. boardroom 
where they face off with everybody kind of has that same sort of vibe. But yeah, again, that I don't, I don't think quite Empire Easter egg. Yeah, definitely not an Easter egg, but definitely something. There's something there. Something existed. Yeah, it's it's an ode to it. I I, I think that's the best way to put it. I love also how the heist movie this section feels. <laughs> like it feels like Ocean's Eleven in space. It, okay, you got Ocean's Eleven in space. I got Star Wars crossed with Night at the Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Nice. <laughs> Quicksilver's museum. Amazing. Yep. That's I mean, that's that's really what made me think of. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's a great comparison. I, I just the night at the museum stands out in my head for some reason. It's just I think it's I think it's the second movie that my brain is like, oh, this went from being good to like oof. <laughs> Like the first movie had a very Jumanji like kind of fun feel. And the second movie was like, ooh, we're really trying to make money now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. Totally fair. Yeah. Um, and Jumanji, not just because Robin Williams is in it. Right. <laughs> right. The uh, if you want a good representation of a sequel to Night at the Museum, <laughs> watch the uh, Night at the Museum Workaholics episode. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've seen that one. I'm sure you have because I used to watch Workaholics all the time. It was kind of a stop thing. Right. True. True. Um, I feel like I saw that one more recently, though, because I don't remember all of the Workaholics stuff. But yeah, I, I mean, mm-hmm. great, great movie, great franchise. So we uh, we get this heist movie feel throughout this section where they're breaking in. They're carving open the glass. They you know use a jam field to prevent uh, sound from leaving. It's, it's all it's all very well executed in the way that they kind of break into this place. And it's like, a, does the jam field hold in pressure or was that a separate thing that they used? I think it was a separate thing. I can't remember. I think it was. I think it was a separate thing, like a pulse bubble or something like that, which they have mentioned pulse bubbles before. Okay. If I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. We have the book, but it's over there on the bed and I can't be bothered. Well, fair enough. I'd have the book right here. And, <laughs> oh, uh, wow. That's fascinating. No, I could definitely. Like, I also can't be bothered. <laughs> over a foot. Uh, but yeah, that's seems seems like what it is. So mm-hmm. that's what it is. Head cannon. Important. So I, I really also like the scene where they're looking at the building, right? And you've silvers. They remind me of the industrious bees. And I think that's where we get kind of the trader room. Yes, that's what I was what thinking. Talking Th- about. This is this is the scene I was thinking of at that point. Yeah. When I mentioned yeah, that. I think it gives it that trader room vibe and kind of the whole picture of the the giant pillars of the building too are are just fascinating. If you do you think that Quicksilver owns most of this moon? I got I was under the, the impression whole that Quicksilver owned this moon. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he does too. I was just curious. That I mean that that was that was the impression that I got was that yeah. this was his his I domain. feel like the syndicate owned one of the ports, wasn't that? That was, that was a part of the conversation with Rollo, I think, that that was one of the ways in. So okay. I didn't I didn't catch that. But that could easily was, be like his employees could, and uh, an infiltration of this group who all got stationed or all got jobs at the same place who kind of. Yeah, it could just be a mob run, thing. Run a back alley sort of business on. Right quicksilver's property yeah definitely definitely true could like like i was thinking it could just be a mob thing like that would totally connect as well mm-hmm. i mean it is the syndicate right right so also the little slice of the academy on 115 again and getting kind of that flashback that victor initiates kind of makes me want to see that you know yeah i don't know again i'm still very glad that pierce avoided the trap of a second school novel after red rising and kind of the the battle school but i would dig like a 100 120 page novella that took place during that time i think we'd mentioned maybe doing a like a graphic novel like the sons varies yeah um i i think you and i were talking about this a little bit off air the idea of doing one like that it would really take a lot of care and juggling to uh, make it relatable and make it likable while not not making the the fan base hate Roke. 
Yeah, I mean, you know the payoffs, right? Like, that's that's yeah. the trouble with doing any prequel or midquel or anything like that is that people already kind of know the payoffs, so you have to be doing it for a good reason where it adds something to a character, right? Like, you, could, you can build in the tragedy of tactus a little bit more would be a great example Mm -hmm. you could build in and build up the fear of carnus which we obviously see a little bit of here in this like tiny little paragraph you know it's it's small enough but it's a good glimpse back at that there are a number of different pieces and components that can fit that way we also at the very end i I totally spaced on putting this in our notes but at the end of chapter 19 he's reflecting on something he's being taught by a blue at the academy which is the whole embolism embolism thing embolism Something like that. I don't know. <laughs> cell, cell death. The like oh, deoxygenation. Yeah. yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep, yep. He's he's reflecting because a blue is telling him about it. But yeah. So you know, it's it kind of like it's nice because it fills in the gaps and spaces, and we get brief flashes of it. But it would be interesting to see. But it's Certainly. also difficult to avoid the trap of you know. Well, that was cool, <laughs> but not important. Exactly. Which is how I feel about the entire Stark World. Their Star Wars Star Wars sequel trilogy. Yeah, well, that's that's fair. That was cool. So the Red <laughs> I Legions, don't have anything else yeah, to say about that. There's, there's a lot there to unpack, but that's an entirely separate podcast. Um, <laughs> as you can tell, I've recently finished my rewatch, and I yeah. I was like, ooh, <laughs> fine. Anyway, the the Red Legion's aggression worsening between the pages feels like a noose tightening on Severus' hold over the various groups within the Rising. The the whole thing where they they're watching and witnessing nukes go off, blowing up a peninsula is just kind of wild from space, right? Like seeing that from space. What do you make of the nukes? What do you make of that whole scene? It, it took up so little time and such a small portion of this that it's hard to really have a grasp on what to think of it. I'm excited to see sort of the resolution of it. I'm sure we'll find out. Right after this cliffhanger you put me on, because we'll be able to talk to people that presumably know what's going on. I don't know. I don't know about Harmony having access to it. I think it's possible. And like Darrow said, if she had them, she would use them. But I I think a more likely reality would be this was an attack by gold on on the Red Legion that will get pinned on the Red Legion. (laughs) No, it's fair. The Jackal has been using extreme tactics, right? Like that's been mm-hmm. his whole. And also his, whole his entire sort of thing has been media manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. He's kind of been anti campaigning against it. And that's what the sovereign is looking down upon mm-hmm. him for doing. Exactly. So yeah, if he can control points. the narrative of what's actually happening and say, oh, no, we didn't drop those nukes. It was them. Yeah. They dropped them on us. Like. If every single news outlet is saying that, who are they going to believe? Totally. Yeah. I could not agree more. And this is also I, the dark, dark world that we find ourselves in today in the real life. So, you know. <laughs> where we don't fully understand where the media is on anything. Where oh, no. We understand it. We just can't trust it. Yes. I, so, I guess. Yeah. You're right. You're. Yeah. 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 yeah you're saying the right things. I'm not. Right. It's it's a dark it's a dark dreary corner where you're never you're never certain what's which is right and what's what's not in terms of any kind of reporting. And I think that that's important to clarify. It's not as though some people aren't trying to do good work, but obviously, you know, people can get fired. They can get pulled out of whatever they're doing. And there are obviously bad actors that exist. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, it's classic. Trust me, I'm lying. There are what I really, list really, really good works of fiction that outline it really, really well. And nonfiction. Um, well, and nonfiction. More importantly, yellow journalism is a thing, folks. It's a, it's a big bit. It's actually even a big bit of the story. Um, to, to briefly highlight it, yellow journalism was a practice that happened in the early 20th century in which newspapers and the like were basically emphasized or, or their, their route because information really didn't matter and could be falsified and no one really cared. They basically just tried to churn out as many yellow pages of paper as possible, which is why it was referred to as yellow journalism. They were just going through and churning through as many documents, selling it for as cheaply as possible, and they could just lie in the pages because no one cared. No one knew what was real and what was not there. The emphasis of pay was not on good journalism. It was strictly, you know, butts in seats. It was strictly it is the number of people who could read clickbait, which is to mod- put it yeah, in today's Yes, exactly. It was pre-modern clickbait. So 
it's a, it's definitely a fascinating thing to look back on. Uh, like I had mentioned, I'd recommend the book if you're interested at all. Uh, Trust me, I'm lying by Ryan Holiday. He also writes a lot about Stoics. Um, no doubt, of course, Pierce he does. Brown is a fan. <laughs> He's the Stoic Who guy. Who do you talk anyway. about that doesn't talk about Stoics? Uh, th- these are like the two, PJ. <laughs> these are the two. Damn, damn you. Okay, so no, you're you've you've made me a believer of it. You've yeah. you've got me into it, but you do talk Shut about it a little bit too. Fuck much. up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> talking about the museum, Quicksilver's museum. Tell me what you liked about it. You you were very focused in on it. I was. So there's a comment on the art style that's stereotypical silver. Can't remember exactly how the, how do they how they say it. But uh they refer to essentially our our era of time as a, a specific type of art. So they talk about free empire America somethingism as opposed to the Roman aesthetic that golds tend to like. Mhm pre-empire ostentationism ostentationism yeah instead of the reserved neoclassical romanism so in vogue with the peerless guard right and just kind of the idea that it, it was it made me think is this sort of style and this taste cliche for silvers because quicksilver is so into it and he influences so much or is is Quicksilver's sort of presentation stereotypically silver as a means of keeping gold's kind of off their, like keeping gold's out of suspicion, I guess, keeping them, man, how am I supposed to word this? So I really, I know what I'm trying to say. I totally know what you're getting at. And it's actually textual to some degree, right? It is. It is a little textual. I really like this line that said here, Darrow's kind of reflecting. So perhaps this Tawdry dreamscape isn't for himself. It's for his guest. And I think that like Tawdry, I'm not, I'm not in most fiction. I'm not a fan of what I'd call $10 words, which are words in which I have to go look it up in a dictionary because I can't understand via context that well. Tawdry dreamscape though works well. Pierce Brown does does lean on some $10 words every now and then or $10 phrases, which can be really beautiful. He executes them well, but I'm, I'm generally someone who prefers to kind of just be able to absorb everything on the page as it stands mm-hmm. without any additional kind of interpretation or needing to go too far out of the book. Kind of breaks you out of it. So, but Tawdry Dreamscape is very specific. And I think it gets that that image of... It, it raises, and I think to some degree kind of answers the question that you're asking, which is he forges this identity for others. And he's also associated it with silvers because ultimately he is the highest up silver and he probably influences everyone else underneath. Right. So that that's, that's sort of my question is, is he taking on the stereotypical silver as a means of presenting himself as a stereotypical silver or is mm-hmm. his taste creating the silver stereotype yeah and it's it's hard to say either way but it's an interesting thought yeah it's it's definitely hard to say it would be something where we need a larger picture of the world but i think you could you could argue that from the outer perspective it would be that he is like the pinnacle of taste even though he doesn't believe in it he's he's very much using it as a front to guide everyone to believe that like that's the way to be okay I think that's I, I textual. Guess, at this I guess point. the way to really figure it out would be dissecting what his room looked like, his own private chambers. Mm-hmm. Does he have any art in there? If so, what does it look like? And I, I know where they're in his his chambers at some point, but I don't know if they really talk about the aesthetic of it that much. Yeah, no, I think I think we get stuck on the bed for a moment and who's in the bed. It's a pink. And then we figure out it's Mateo and that's a whole thing. I don't think that it sticks around too much because there's so much clippy action that happens there. But I do. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think that's something that could be filled out inside of a TV show very well is you could go from the outward perspective of some like outlandish bombastic art of whatever is modern and then cut to the room, and the room is sparse and different. That's important because it symbolizes the character change, like you're saying. So, speaking of, how would you describe ostentationism? Ooh. Because I, I can't think of what modern, uninfluenced by other, like, completely stand on, stand on its own 
21st century art looks like other so, than memes man when when i think about <laughs> ostentatious when i think about the word ostentatious mm-hmm. i think the the dictionary definition will give you enough to go on and i bet you can jump off from here characterized by vulgar or pretentious display designed to impress or attract notice in my head the first thing that pops up is banksy okay i can okay okay yeah i could see that i don't think that banksy itself is ostentatious i think it has something to say but i think in general there is this need to be loud in in all like fashion and art and everything else. And that's why I think we're also seeing a trend back into like neoliberalism or not, neo, not neoliberalism, neo minimalism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very so different. Th- that's, uh, that's sort of my problem in thinking about this is I could, I would based on this text and the disintegration of our country in general, I could think of ourselves as pre empire America <laughs> in this context. And I'm trying to think of what our unique identifying art style is. Banksy, I guess, is a good way to put it. But even that goes back 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just memes. Yeah, I mean, true. I mean, there's like abstract stuff, but even like that's all rooted in abstract art that goes back 50 years, 60 years more. Yeah, memes, memes are the art of the people, arguably. I'm thinking to some degree, especially within the context of Quicksilver's exhibits, I'm thinking yeah. more... Oh, like, no, I'm not saying he has a bunch of memes right hanging now. on the wall. Yeah, right. right. Like, I, I don't I think agree. he actually has that, but... Oh, no, I, I definitely agree and understand what you're saying. I do think that memes play a much larger cultural note. I don't know that they're art, though. Mm. Um, I don't know about that. I don't, I don't think that they'll be looked back on as art. I think they will be looked back on closer to the way that we think about old political comic strips i was just gonna say political Um, cartoons but i think it's i think they're a step further than political cartoons they're more like a live heartbeat where political cartoons were commentary right they have to be consumed now they have to be consumed in conjunction with the moment the moment like i said earlier bean dad no one's gonna get that in a year like it is factually abstract everyone's gonna be like what the fuck's bean dad <laughs> it's just it's not gonna make it's not gonna make any sense that this guy went on a nine hour journey with his daughter trying to teach her how to open a can without actually teaching her anything <laughs> like it's, it's just not gonna be a thing right mm-hmm. yeah yeah i me, memes are definitely interesting i think they're more i think they're closer to to they're somewhere between journalism slash news because news is immediate journalism mostly can be immediate there are obviously larger impacts and commentary momentary commentary there's somewhere right. in that space it's hard to say and then there's the the comment from the i guess back and forth between ragnar and uh victra victra sighs gory hell man's got the taste of a tabloid socialite <laughs> ragnar cocks his head at the dog what is it art victra victra says supposedly So presumably she falls into the sort of gold point of view of what art is very sort of Roman esque, which Mm -hmm. is essentially just kind of the human form. When I think of Roman art, like it's all realistic interpretations of specific humans. I can't think of any sort of other Roman artworks that that stand out, at least. Yeah, It's very, very much realism, very much, obviously very sculpture focused. I can't even think of Roman painting off the top of my Um, head. Well, anything famous, at least. What's what's really interesting, and maybe maybe viewers and listeners don't know this, but a lot of the what we assume are marble statues, a lot of them were painted or metal statues were originally painted. They just faded and degraded over time. But they were still they were still sculptures. Yeah, that's what I'm I'm saying. I'm I'm talking like. Paint on canvas artwork. Paint paint on stone or carve into stone was more of a thing. Right. And I, I guess that's that's kind of where that's where yeah, my, that's, my disconnect that's where, like, is. What, what the, other era the cultural or what other culture was such a big deal, right? Is because it, it art shifted in a yeah. big way. So, yeah, no. But even okay. even before Romans, like uh, every every other sort of era and region and society that i can think of has 2d painted artworks 
There, there are Roman paintings. I'm sure I mean, there it's, are, it's, but there's nothing that's prominent and well known. No, so or well what studied I would, at least. What I would say, PJ, is that a lot of what we assume is Greek art is also Roman art because they share so much. That's fair. Background um, that like ancient Roman art and Greek art go hand in hand. A lot of the pottery and whatnot, it's all inherited, right? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, and I mean the the other component, if we're talking art in quotes, uh, Romans wrote a shit ton of stuff down. Which that's other, true. That's true. Others did not. That's very so, true. Yeah, which is part of the reason that yeah there there is man we are so off topic but i think it's worth mentioning No, i think it's on topic um, i think i think we're we're well, talking I'm a, about i'm about to go off topic okay <laughs> so that's more where my brain went um so much of western culture is so well documented that it can make components of eastern culture hard to get into around similar time frames the indus valley for instance is is something that i find very fascinating inside of indian like india indian culture and there are things that are recorded, but there are also just time gaps that exist mm-hmm. in which either writing or whatnot didn't exist. And so a lot of its interpretation and that's where Roman culture becomes so interesting because it is directly translated into our modern languages. That makes it easier for us to understand, of course. But also the other component of that is like Chinese and Japanese. That's why they're so prevalent. Part of the reason they're so prevalent in culture. I by no means am a culture expert, but with my analysis, that's where I'm at. I love to study eastern stuff but it's easier to study western stuff because it's more prominent it stands out and they wrote more shit down that's either hasn't been decayed or lost over time Mm -hmm. that's fair yeah that's that's my off topic (laughs) there you go so anything else on the on the museum uh no i think we uh we got into it and we got out of it and then we uh kind of danced around it's corpse for a little while. So uh, I think I'm good with that. <laughs> cool. So uh, Darrow's faith in several troubles even further here at the end of the chapter, reflecting on the choices that Darrow himself would make or that Fitchner would have made in a similar, you know, in, in similar shoes, in a similar circumstance. If it succeeds, this is a quote from Darrow. If it succeeds, what do we usher in after the dust has settled and the helium no longer flows? A dark age and... You know, we know that that's a title of a book that we're going to read in the series. We know that now. But like. But like, we don't we don't know that when this was released. Does that leave you with some speculation as to what that book's about? Absolutely. Entirely. Yeah. <laughs> it tells me exactly what that book's about. Um, it's it's worth noting, and I'm sure a number of our listeners that have, have read the book series will know the book titles for the most part were pulled from the previous book or a previous book in the series to make the next book title at the very least pierce brown has said that the book title uh for dark age obviously came from here and it's also an iron gold and then the title for for the sixth book which has not been announced yet is somewhere inside of dark age so Um, something that we can speculate on when we get oh can i speculate on it now Sure. All right. I'm going to grab Dark Age on book six. No, 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 no. You cannot just open to a random page on Dark Age. You might get spoiled on the entire series. Shit. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. But there there's some there's some <laughs> world changing shit in there. Okay, never mind. We got to get through the first trilogy and then maybe you can do that. But fair enough. I don't I don't trust. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You'll taint your I had it in my you. hands. I was ready. It'll uh, it'll totally spoil you, but very excited to get there. It's going to be a hell of a time. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's it's such it's such a good quote. And it does kind of as we'd mentioned in the previous episode, this whole crumbling of their relationship, this whole dissolving as it happens is frustrating. I, I mean, to, to witness. And um, I guess a question I have is. Yeah. And maybe maybe this gets revealed later. So if it does, don't necessarily like ruin that. But. Do you think this line of thinking comes from his previous conversation with his mother in Golden Sun? This sort of dark age conversation? Yeah. So, I mean, th- this this thought, like this this quote that yeah. you just read. Right. I totally think it does. I think that it shares precisely those feelings. And do you think he would have had this feeling? I Yes, it shares those feelings. But do you think he would have had those feelings had he not had that conversation with his mother? 
I think that he needed both the conversation with his mom and with Nerol that we spoke about at length yep. in order to kind of arrive at this point. And even then, I don't know that he's fully there right now. I don't know that he's fully come to terms with it. It is in his mind. He, it, it is on his mind, though. And he is yes. thinking about it. It's definitely on his mind. Yep. I, I do agree and concur with that thought. Okay. Cool. So, chapter 16, Paramore. Love the title right off the bat. And I find it very interesting, of course. We get reintroduced here to a character that actually you said back in an earlier episode that we would see again. It was a prediction from a long time ago. It was before we made the prediction rules, but I feel like it's it's a worthy drink because the payoff has now happened. So, cheers. I mean, go for it. I do not remember this. <laughs> to be completely honest, Mateo had completely been removed from my mind. <laughs> removed throughout from my the, memory uh, throughout the carving of your brain that was golden sun which uh, and, and most of red rising dude you were still stuck on mateo and most of red rising was i really yeah kind of like you were stuck on the whole group though it was mateo dancer i don't know Mickey. if i mentioned mateo after yeah maybe the not. interactions maybe not. with mateo maybe not. you you definitely did at least one more week afterwards okay. but yeah okay, all right one week one week on on the outset i think is uh fair but uh no i had forgotten that he existed so we come back into the <laughs> straight room. up we come back into the room it's ridiculous that you forgot about him I'm just no kidding. i mean i He's, remember um, him in hindsight and i remember him after like he got reintroduced but you know he's he's mentioned a handful of times for sure right I, like it's no i i'm not I'm, all right once again, so not, here not here's where i go back on like my that. memory thing uh-huh uh, it's shit. It's all bad. <laughs> right, right. That was that was a very beginning, very beginning thing. No, I I think that Mateo is a very interesting character in his own way. Right, like he's got attitude. He's he's not showing up, but it's it's interesting that he comes back here. Right, like there's something about him coming back now with Quicksilver. So I I have a feeling I know exactly what I talked about with Mateo because I remember mm-hmm. this. The uh, the dancing lessons with Arya Stark in Game of Thrones mm-hmm. is her her dancing her sword dancing teacher. What I can't yes. remember exactly what he was referred to as. Yep, but that's who he reminded me of, and I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure I mentioned that in in the episode that it, we talk about him. Yeah, we definitely do, and I don't know, I don't, I think he's just briefly mentioned in one chapter in Golden Sun, Mateo. Um, and you did compare him to Arya Stocks, Starks. Arya Stocks. Arya Stock. Stack. It's Boston. And, you know, uh, it's bad, shit, was, bad, 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 bad Boston <laughs> accent. Bad. Put me in the garbage. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> the garbage. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> uh, it's it's a bad time. I'm bad at accents to begin with. So this is this is not good. You're bad at most things. Oh, my God. So. Man, this this whole thing with Mateo is interesting where he gets represented here. He's brought up for the first time really since the first book. Darrow very much is like, stop it. Stop what you're doing. And Severo just doesn't react, which just adds to the kind of tension in their relationship. Yeah, it's it's just it's just bad. And like if Severo would have listened to Darrow, they maybe could have extracted more information. Imagine if Darrow would have pulled down his face guard now, talked with Mateo, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it would have been interesting, but it could have backfired. Yeah, in what way? If he's straight up been converted and is mm-hmm. no longer at all uh, not not beholden to what's the term I'm looking for? Symp- sympathetic towards the sons of Ares? Sympathetic towards the society, right? No, no, no. He's sympathetic towards the so- the society now. I'm saying if he yep. was no longer right. sympathetic towards the sons yes. of Ares, yep, yep, fair. That action could have completely backfired. Mm-hmm. And we don't know that he's sympathetic towards the society now. We presume it potentially, but uh, that kind of got that that line of di- dialogue got completely shut down by Severo. Right, right. But I, I mean, I for it, good reason. Yes, yes. It begs the question, though. What does that does that paint any kind of picture potentially for you for Quicksilver? Do you think that there's anything there, or do you think Mateo's just like a pink? You know, like. The fact that he's having, I mean, this gets revealed later, the fact that he's having diplomatic conversations with Daxo and Mustang and Cavex 
and Moira Cassius. That's the that's the thing that kind of throws it off. How so? What do you mean? How so? Like hypothetically, if if Cavix and Daxo and and Mustang are still sort of on the side of Darrow, if not explicitly, sort of back in the background. Yeah, they're at least against Octavia, right? Right. Having a couple, like three, not 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 three, but two of the the knights. It's three. It's three from each side. Yeah, two no, knights, and, but two and a fury. two Olympic knights and a fury mm-hmm. on top of Mustang and uh, the Telonuses. Uh, by by the way it looked, those six were all kind of all on the same side. Mm-hmm. And it didn't seem like Quicksilver was necessarily against them. They all seemed to be huh. conducting a coup against the Jackal. But uh, that, that okay. doesn't necessarily mean that they're against Octavia. That's fair. So it's it's safe to assume that Moira is against or is for Octavia, right? That, I, I mean, I guess it's the- it's hypothetically safe to assume, but we don't know that and we won't know that because because <laughs> she's fucking dead and I already took fair, a shot for fair. it. But but Cassius, at the very least, is for Octavia, right? The knights you would, are there you would think. because they're you would they're think. the arms. Yeah, right. So speaking to the points on the knights and the points on the fury and these other three that were formerly of the second moon rebellion, we'll call it. Um, is, you know, it feels kind of like a peace meeting to some degree, but does, that's not necessarily the full context. But it also wasn't entirely... It wasn't made I guess, clear whether or not Cassius and the other Olympic knight and Moira were working directly with Mustang and the Telemannuses. Yes, I, I definitely like, agree. I think the question that I would ask to you is more in the realm of, do you think, what does Quicksilver have on this? Why are they meeting with Quicksilver? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I can't. I, I can give like a vague idea without like hinting at anything. I feel like at this point, the text points to the relationship that he has with the Jackal, which you kind of talked about. Yeah, um, clear, clearly that's a part of it. But also the Jackal's not there. Yeah. And seemingly they're speaking in a way that was not clearly, but seemingly there was some subterfuge going on. There was some hidden agendas. Everyone believed Mustang was out in the outer rim. Like mm-hmm. th- there, there is some secretive movement going on as a means, hypothetically and presumably, to have this meeting without the jackal knowing about it. It's fair, but we know Mustang but, is the smartest person in the universe. But does Mustang <laughs> approach this as allies with Cassius, or does Cassius just happen to be a separate arm of the conversation? Fair, interesting. So, I mean, we kind of, we kind of like to some degree gave away the goat on uh, on what's going on in the room <laughs> but before we get there sorry everybody spoilers mention, spoilers uh <laughs> you should have already read exactly but we we skipped over a very important part pj it's very important okay uh sophocles is so there. quote that's all i care about page 126 <laughs> food request looks like someone oh, has did. ordered a this whole is the most important part <laughs> A whole host of mutton and jam sandwiches and coffee to room C-19. And there it is, our delicious theme of this series. The cooks giving away the ghost of where Quicksilver and, as we've mentioned, the gang of other I don't know if you're using the term giving away the ghost properly. I don't think I was at all when I wrote it either, and I just kind of went with it. I originally wrote goat, and then I deleted it and wrote ghost, and then like put in quotation marks, or in in, uh, brackets, goat? ghost question mark and then just ended up going with ghost it was like whatever it's fine the point we'll be is, late in the episode we'll be drunk it'll the be the okay. most important people in this society as far as figuring shit out and getting what you need goes is the cooks true they got us to where we needed to be like they they are the weak point in security always always but also <laughs> the strong point of our hearts and the backbone of this story. Well, yes, it's I mean, important. Nobody that. doubts that the cooks right. are everything. The cooks are Damn everything. It. We'll never forget the cooks. <laughs> uh, has, has anyone else like outside of our podcast talked this extensively about cooks? No. Not okay. At all. I didn't know um, if this was like a thing 
that you've nope. been pulling from like other conversations or if it's no, just pulling this out of my from ass, PJ. <laughs> no, I love it. I love the idea <laughs> that cooks are the like breaking point of society. It uh, it feels like it every episode, every every book. Cooks have had a very important part. Golden you know, Sun was a, dis- disappointingly like lacking in cooks. We had the the strange. Uh, the strange, really kind of skittish cook from Earth who was used yeah. to serving the Ash Lord. And that was about it. He didn't give up a whole lot of information. No. He just yeah. gave them way it, too much food and spoke too, incoherently. Too few cook occurrences in book two. Yep. There was a lot of consonants. Very There's the sophomore slump. <laughs> um so to finish up the to finish up the chapter 16 roundup we've kind of already talked about it but we do we breach into the room we run into some familiar faces moira cassius daxo cabax the death knight and mustang so that's a that's an interesting thing you just brought up the death knight um he is somebody who darrow says he knows all of them and i took mm-hmm. that as he personally has connections to and knows all of them. I didn't take that yeah. as he recognizes the, all of them. So this is the Death Knight, someone that we know as readers. Yeah, man, totally. I know. I know it'll get revealed. Yep. I know. I know things will happen. And I know you can't say shit, but that's where my brain's at. Like, who is the Death Knight? Seems pretty reasonable, right? When would he have met him? You know, would it have been? Is it a him? maybe? Did well, it say it would say him? Eh, I don't maybe. know if it did. Because I think it's Leah. <laughs> Leah's fucking dead, dude. <laughs> Leah's extra dead now. <laughs> but was very dead before. The The point stands, though, on, on the Death Knight. You know, it's a, it's a good question. You know, the only space that we could have been introduced to him at this point would have been when? When's that, like, weird gap that it'd be cool if a novella was there? The Academy. Oh, the Academy gap. That'd be really cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something could fit there. Pierce, we beg. <laughs> are so there it, are there any knights, any of the Olympic knights that are siblings? Um, not that I know of. Is not that, that I can think of? Is that a rule, there's, or is that just kind of how it has happened so far? There's at least one family tree knight that happens at one point, but I don't know. That's not. That's more of an appointment thing. I think it's you earn the place as the knight. Okay. My, I yeah. guess my question is, could could a single family hypothetically gain essentially unlimited power by becoming all of the knights? I mean, maybe, but at that point, you'd be better suited shooting for sovereign, right? I mean, that's the idea of who has more power, the president or the Supreme Court. I mean, the answer is the Supreme Court. Yeah. But <laughs> and if <laughs> no you control all of, the, all of the Supreme Court... As a single family, like you have mm-hmm. the most power in the entire world. Yeah, yeah, correct. I, I guess like the the question here with the knights is more they're more like in that's actually the point of the court courts is they're the enforcement arm of the law. Yeah, uh, but like the, the, the knights are the court. Yeah, as no, far as I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the knights are that, the judici- judiciary branch. Fair, fair point. The representatives of the ju- judiciary in their own rights. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's totally fair. Um, we run into them again. This is that moment that we talked about earlier that feels like the scene straight out of the Empire Strikes Back on Cloud City. It feels yep. like they're walking into the room and Vader's already there and you're like, fuck, because Cassius and Moira and the Death Knight are there. You're like, shit, fuck. We already lost. Like, we're, we're coming here to win and we lost. So I guess it's a little bit different in that in that situation, Vader's already there. And in this mm-hmm. situation, the Jackal nor the Sovereign like neither are in, t- in attendance. No, but Cassius and Moira in the Death Knight. Like there, there are elements there. You're right, though. It's not the Jackal. It's not our immediate what we consider the primary antagonist. Except for Cassius is, I'd call him a primary. He's antagonist. a personal. Like that. That's more of a personal antagonist. He's also as opposed a knight, to a societal though. antagonist. Yeah, he is. That's true. Yeah, you're right. I, I I think it I think it goes but both ways. I, I do agree. I, I with think you. I just think that him it's, as a Bologna trumps him as a knight in Darrow's eyes, or at least in my yeah. eyes as a reader. So we move into chapter seventeen, killing golds. I love that after this very dramatic header for the chapter, 
we get the very first line of the chapter is hold your fire <laughs> it there's just this like brilliant irony that goes from this like high note of the announcement of chapter 17 killing golds into hold your fire <laughs> and then we get like a very tense conversation all right uh please remind me to never choose you as uh the reader of an audiobook oh never i would never be the reader for an audiobook um because that was fucking no. awful no, I mean, kind of intentionally awful, but I was trying no, to differentiate. I know. I know. <laughs> Be cool doing like a cast voice and an ensemble thing, but there's yeah. no way that I can pull off multiple voices instead of the same presentation. That's fair. That's fair. I've been listening to uh, an audiobook in which James Franco narrates, and hmm. he, uh, I mean, James Franco does a fine job in some things, and he's a pretty good audiobook narrator. In this case, Every time he leans into his signature, like Russian accent or Eastern European accent, it's the same character. And I can't help but hear <laughs> the artist. I can't help but hear <laughs> we so in his voice. <laughs> I just want to scream. Oh, good. Listening to a Stephen King book right now that he narrated. And it's it's a great book. I, I actually hadn't read it before. Um, old classic called uh, The Dead Zone. But yeah, it's um. That that little bit just like hit me out of the story during this one chapter in which uh, Eastern European doctor is talking to him. And it's just like, no, <laughs> no, put it away. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, the tension in this whole thing between Darrow, Severa and Victra and the rest of the room is just fucking palpable. There's so much in the pages like weapons are pulled out and weapons are the, the pulse fist in, on Victra's armor or not Victra. Mustang's armor starts to bloom around her hand and like grow there there's the slow unfurling of all of their weapons the evaluation of targets it's just tension it's a the, master class on tension the sort of heads up display targeting of weak points in armor was really really cool yeah it was a brief uh brief mention but really cool <clears throat> it totally reminded me of iron man to to the same degree that like jarvis would mention something being like, ah, oh, yes, hit here. But it wasn't obviously voiced. It just reminded me of that same kind of like heads up display sort of manner. Yeah, I loved it. And then kind of the the back and forth among the team members of the like cutting of comms that happens to Darrow is just brutal. I mean, from Severo, because everyone's kind of questioning what to do now that they've got familiar faces and people that they think are at least semi on their side. Right. Like Daxo, Cavax and Mustang are definitely against Octavia, so far as we know, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily pro sons. Well, they were. That's the thing. They were against Octavia. We don't necessarily yeah, right, know that right. they are. That's still. why I said necessarily, right? Is we don't necessarily know that, but we know that they're not pro sons. Right. Or at least we know that they're not explicitly working with the sons. Mm -hmm. They could very well be sympathizers. That's Democrats, to say. as has been said in other books. Yes. With the hard K. Yes, the hard K. You no, know, it's it's definitely a thing. And this this whole chapter is, like I said, a master class in tension. It's worth noting here that Ragnar leans in to the Reaper for the command, where everyone else is kind of questioning what to do or who to listen to between Severo. And I think that gets back to the thing that you said earlier about kind of the family dynamic. And I think it also breaks the rule of the howlers first mentality, which we also talked about on the front side in which Ragnar doesn't choose the Howlers first. He he chooses his stains, his choice to Darrow. I, I don't want to say his stains because he did offer the stains, but it's more like Darrow earned the loyalty than accepted yeah, I mean, he, he, the obedience. Think about but, that, yeah. that monologue he made to uh, Mustang in the mines, yeah. where he talks about the, the scars that he earned for the Reaper. Mm-hmm. And also how much more weight that holds than everything else because of because of the freedom that he was given to choose to to earn those scars mm -hmm. as opposed to right. being forced to receive them. Yeah, I, I just think it's particularly interesting looking at Ragnar right now in the lane of him being a howler as well as being more loyal to Darrow than he is to the howlers. You know, when he also said don't take these oaths in vain or don't take this moment in vain. Well, because this moment, I mean, but. up until then, 
up until this point where there's sort of confusion, they were one in the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Howlers were acting on behalf of Darrow, even though, even though they were technically being led by Severo and were created by Severo. The entire yeah. point was to act on behalf of the Reaper. Right. Right. So there, there wasn't sort of any sort of dissonance between those thought processes. And that's, that's, I think, why a lot of the Howlers are kind of having trouble here. Whereas Ragnar has always had strict loyalty and respect for Darrow. Mm -hmm. And that extended into the Howlers as opposed to the other way around. Right. Whereas everyone else, it's kind of inverted. Where they have respect for the Howlers and loyalty towards the Howlers. And by extension, respect for and loyalty towards Darrow. And that's why they, yes. they kind of experience this sort of questioning of who to follow and what to do. Whereas Ragnar is able to very easily and very quickly suss it out and say, okay, well, there's a problem here, but my point is to follow Darrow. And the, that's the howlers were sort of his means of following Darrow as, a, as opposed to the other way around. I think that's actually a really great point to make is that, there is an obvious separation of mentality. I, I would say the only people who aren't fully separated that way are the original Howlers, like Clen and Pebble. No, but even them, even them, they were recruited by and trained by and led by Severo from the beginning. Darrow never led them. Yeah, well, I mean, Darrow did lead the Howlers in battle. Darrow was, Darrow was the... I felt like he was more of the spiritual leader of the Howlers. He never... He was never... He was never the the head of the howlers he no, was no. the reason for the existence of the howlers but sever was the head right right and i i totally agree with that methodology of naming i guess my point is just more that the original howlers attach more to the original moments that they all shared and so i think that there's a but they shared so much there. more of those moments with with sever than they did with darrow yeah i guess especially where, like, especially when darrow was gone at the institute and they were still the howlers and still operating under Severo. Yeah, PJ, I'm, I'm I'm not disagreeing with the idea that they still maintain a ton of loyalty there. I think a part of the reason that we see this divergence in who they point to or who they look through for leadership is this this hierarchy that obviously exists, right? Yeah, that's fair. Within the Howlers. And so there's a conflict that's at the immediate top of the Howlers that exists even here. And the Howlers are supposed to be the people that are very loyal to Severo, right? And so my point is not that they should be more loyal to Severo than they aren't. They should be a by all rights by the, the code that they've taken, but they clearly have questions and they clearly have questions isn't the right phrase, but they clearly have their priorities confused in this situation in which they're confronted with both a conflict on the leadership level and a conflict with what they're seeing as an opportunity in front of them, which is some of their former compatriots you know, looking at them and it's being like, well, what do we do? I, I think that that's the biggest conflict that's mm -hmm. presented in Ragnar looking specifically to Darrow speaks to the side of the relationship that you're talking about, wherein he values Darrow more than he values the Howlers. He thinks maybe of Darrow as a first family instead of the Howlers as a as the first family that they're supposed to. So be. I, that I think I think of that making that judgment is a little bit muddy. Um because I, I think we have to get into what Ragnar sees in the Howlers and what he believes in as far as the Howlers go. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think him following Darrow is him, in his mind, holding that value of the Howlers, our first family. Because in his mind, Darrow is the leader of the Howlers and the reason for the existence of the Howlers. I think that's that's the point I'm trying to get across is sure. I, I think a lot of the older howlers don't hold necessarily that exact same sentiment and that same sort of line of thinking and connection points being made. So I, I don't think at all like I don't think at all that Ragnar is conflicted in his oath to the howlers. Mm, I see. Because I, I, see. I think his entire reason for the existence of the howlers in his mind is Darrow. He sees it all as service to Dara. Sure. Yeah, I I definitely understand where you're coming from more clear more clearly now. So that that makes sense to me. 
It, I mean, it's it's nuanced and it's kind of a nitpicky argument to make, but I think yeah, I think it makes a distinct enough difference in their thought processes that I think it's worth bringing up. No, yeah, totally, totally. I I can definitely see that read on their characters in that comparison for sure. Like I, I'm I'm not thinking Ragnar is abandoning his oath to the Howlers because of him following Darrow. I think this is him. This is his act of following his oath to the Howlers. Yeah, I can see that. Mm. We'll see how that <laughs> unfolds going forward. But yeah, so we we move into the rest of the scene, which is just a ton of beautiful action, right? Mm-hmm. This is we're just, this is cinema like this is yeah. cinematic writing. Once again, it's just it's flawless. It's excellent. So until the, the tension finally snaps Ragnar ends up throwing one of his razors through the head of the Death Knight, and that makes him more like the kind Dead Knight. Sudden. Am I right? <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for cutting you off in that. <laughs> he's, he is, a, he's, he's now the Dead Knight, or she. He, Does it ever yeah. say gender? I, I, feel like it's a, I feel like it's a he, but... I mean, that's... I don't I don't know if it explicitly says either way. I feel like it I feel like I mean we could look at it but I don't I don't know if it's necessary. I mean in my mind the death side the death night. In my mind I saw it as a uh, as a man as well but you know most of the women golds are bigger than me anyway so that yes. says something but it seemed like sort of okay do you, <laughs> do you want to know exactly who I thought of Ooh. when I heard death night and what I imagined. Arthas? Nope. Oh, damn. More cartoonish. Uh, the Lord of the Rings cartoon Sauron? Nope. Black Knight from yeah. Castle Crashers. Oh, that'll do it. That's that's actually <laughs> acceptable, comparatively. That's that's the best answer. That's a better answer than I gave you. Uh, if any of you have never played Castle Crashers... It's a beautiful game. It's a wonderful game. It really does. It's like a. It's like an hour long game, honestly. Oh God, no! It's longer than an hour. Ah, okay, we've played it in a session. I it's, guess it was probably like, a few hours. No, it's we we've never played through the full game in a session. It's like a at least a fifteen hour game. You will get we've we've immeasurable fun through. in an hour. Yeah. yeah, no, true. It is worth whatever it costs. It's like five dollars, and you can play with four people. It's so right. much fun. It, it's one of it's one of the best games for sure that's a multiplayer platformer that exists yeah, 2d side scroller platformer it's so good. off the rails in terms of all the fun shit it's but so like, good. i cannot recommend castle crashers more it's so much fun we played through that i think what you're thinking pj is that first intro level we play through all the time drunk together oh we do like we played that's through true. the first no, I, section okay i think we've, we've took we've taken like a week and played through the entire game over yeah, the course of yeah. a week when we lived together. Yeah. I think I think the whole game is like maybe 15 hours. Maybe. I don't know if it's that even might that even long. be aggressive. I don't think yeah. it's even that long. I th- I think I think it's probably less than 10. It's probably around 10. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Anyway. I've only beaten it 3 times. So Fair enough. Regardless, the Black Knight from Castle Crashers, which I think is a DLC character. Mhm. Is he an enemy at one point? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's an enemy at one point. But just that's what I imagine. Just this like brooding large black character just seeping black energy. Yeah. I think technically he's called the Necromancer, but yes, it's the Black Knight. Mm-hmm. Cuz they're all known by colors. But yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I totally get kind of the same mental image of like this big kind of horned thing, even though we don't get horns in the description. We don't, but we also don't get cartoon in the description. And I imagined like a real world scenario of just superhumans fighting. And then this cartoon black knight in the center of it getting skewered by Ragnar. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Hey, PJ, do you know do you know who's in this scene? Uh, who's in this? Kavax Al Telemanus. Yes, is in this scene. This now, is, just this the, is my the spirit animal, reminder, right? Of uh, of the Telemanus. And is unfortunately, kind of Sophocles is not ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but Kavax fighting Kavax yep. and Daxo fighting Ragnar together, phenomenal against Ragnar alone, <laughs> and 
cannot deal with him um <laughs> which is hilarious there's a lot of various tense mo- moments that happen cassius taking down victra in various like side swipey blows we learn that cassius has learned the willow way or at least components of it from from aja aja probably which is another another component here that's just fantastic darrow kills moira in just a absolute blood curdling yeah, melting inside of the skin one of fist one of the very fist. few characters i said would live through this yeah. book yeah dead um, as a doornail yep she uh she gets melted so firmly in her suit that you know it's described as like the smartest of the furies just dead i mean her so, brains are still there i don't know i mean pudding sure they're not connected to anything i like a good brain pudding but really when you when you melt down a brain what's the difference i i also love this line that comes after that this is the reaper who laid cassius low who slew carnus who gold cannot kill it's just like Ooh. Mm-hmm. nice nice little shiver moment inside of this section yeah. we're finally back to darrow being darrow i <laughs> i really wanted work. this and i know it's too early for it but i wanted this to be the payoff of expect me but i, mm. I think that's going to be more of a a campaign specifically targeted at Cassius and the Sovereign. Yeah. I don't think it would have been that. I don't think it would have landed very well if he had made some sort of snide comment about, I told you to expect me or something like that in this yeah. scenario. And does does Cassius even know that it's the Reaper at the, or that it's See, zero at this point? I don't think so. I don't think that he gets a view. And I think that that's a worthy question to ask you is I don't think that he gets a view at all because he's out of the room. I think by the time that Mustang actually yeah, reacts, to I think him. you're right. I think that's textual in the way that it's written on the page. Mm-hmm. So, and Darrow obviously can't speak because the only thing he wants to do is stop everyone from fighting. That's when he finally pulls down the helmet to reveal. Right. So any other moments stand out to you here? Hmm. <laughs> I guess not entirely. I think everything else is very beautifully written, but nothing nothing that we haven't already mentioned. Yeah, totally fair. I mean, I think it's worth mentioning that Mustang didn't just immediately murder him upon seeing who it was. Yeah, true. So I, I think you, your, your sort of idea of Mustang not knowing if it's the Jackal is oh, yeah. kind of dead in the water there, unless she's also somehow on his side i guess she is his twin right she still has a family attachment that's still i don't know if she does to the jackal now maybe maybe not i feel we'll, like we'll that's to, gone we'll have to see i would think so after, after the father but also after the constant urging of darrow to not trust him yeah but he's still family right so she didn't kill him i, I agree with yourself Lord now too. huh right yeah right right and also that would have made Severo this book kicking. so much easier this series so much easier if she just fucking murdered right him. right severo is also kicking darrow for not killing people that's actually the entire next chapter which <laughs> chapter 18 the abyss so mustang <laughs> runs away at the end of the last chapter and uh what'd you make of of orion being alive the pack still being out there and mustang's decision to run i think it makes sense i think it makes a lot of sense mustang deciding to run i think there's a there's so many different scenarios behind the scenes that we don't have access to that could cause that to happen and be important enough for that to to make sense um right whether or not she's acting as a double agent of some sort whether or not she has other things she's juggling like there's just there's too much possibility there to make any sort of real prediction on that the Pax and Orion being alive, awesome. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Um, I guess the Pax isn't alive, but I don't know. I think it'd be pretty cool if if Pax Pax's disembodied ghost is now like haunting yeah. the Pax. I'd like that. I don't think that's the case, but um but Orion still being alive is wonderful. I'm I'm excited to see where that goes. Mm-hmm. The fact yeah, that it'll... Mustang gave that information to Daryl also tells me that she is at least, at least a little sympathetic towards his cause Mm -hmm. and wants him to succeed in some way. It, it, that's not a bit of information that you would just give to an enemy. 
yeah no i i definitely agree with you i thought i thought you had a little bit more there no um, i i thought i did too but i i i don't think it conveys anything it's, more it's okay no worries so i uh, yeah i de- i definitely agree with you it's very interesting in in terms of who survived and how much like kind of info that we gained here from the strategic move to infiltrate here the core argument between darrow and severo also leading into this chapter has been building for a while but what'd you make of it what'd you make of kind of the expulsion of energy that finally happens here between the two of them uh which which lines are you explicitly talking about here i'm thinking most of this chapter in general so speaking okay. to kind of the decision to cut off darrow's comms yeah. and everyone being like wait he cut your comms so i I think this this kind of this creates a divide, a big divide between Darrow and Severo in the eyes of everyone else, all the other howlers and mm-hmm. between those two themselves. Personally, there are promises that Darrow made to Severo. I don't remember if it's this chapter, or if it's previous about keeping everyone safe. And my prediction just I don't know if it's one of the predictions on this page or on this uh episode but i'm going to make an official prediction here is that darrow darrow's actions and darrow's existence and his his place in this campaign directly cause severo's death after explicitly promising to not let any of the howlers die wow okay and i i think that is going to weigh extraordinarily heavily on darrow yeah, I mean, I would I would think so. <laughs> that only makes sense to me. And uh yeah, I mean, woof, what a what a tough situation to be in. Though I guess I guess we know Severo is still alive after getting picked up by Holiday because he's in the next chapter he's trying to get people to wake up. So maybe maybe I'm just off base. I don't know. That's that's what was going through my mind when I was reading this chapter was Something really, really bad is going like something really bad is going to happen to Severo. Mm -hmm. Severo is going to die and it's going to be basically because of Darrow's actions after explicitly promising that it wouldn't happen. Yeah, that's that's fair. I think that's an interesting point to finish up this chapter. We get a brief reflection on the various captives that we have. We've got Quicksilver, Cavax and Daxo. We're going to take them and take the emergency escape route post this dramatic argument of power between Darrow and Severo, in which the power feels like it's shifted towards Darrow over Severo. Like you said, potentially is dramatically terrible outcomes for Severo down the line. And they eject themselves out of the side of the building in a heroic, screaming, howler kind of move in which Severo just stays silent. Mm. We move into chapter 19, Pressure, which is just two pages so we end with this wonderful chapter in which it explains to the audience what exactly happens when you float through space with an oxygen in your lungs um and kind of the whole process and that's really all this chapter is yes we actually did a little bit of external research on this yes we got into an argument and not i mean not necessarily an argument but um i posited my understanding of how human interaction with space works and Cross pointed out that these aren't necessarily humans as we know them today. So there were a bunch of tests done in Texas. I want to say back in like the 60s where they straight up tested the lifespan of dogs in the vacuum of space. And uh, 15 seconds seems to be the point of uh, uh, like unconsciousness, like the point where there is no more oxygen in the body or blood, period. Two minutes seems to be the threshold of whether or not the dog will be alive at the end of the experiment anything after two minutes all of them were dead i think you mentioned that pierce brown consulted a physicist Mm -hmm. in this writing yeah it was and those those numbers different things those numbers make total sense in that scenario two two and a half isn't that crazy of a stretch especially if it's differences if, if the if the death threshold for a dog in the 1960s is two minutes <laughs> right right uh two and a half minutes for a evolved Extra version of human. humanity a more stacked human if you will a double human a double think. human yes excellent um, <laughs> being two and a half minutes i i think that's 
understandable. I think they're going to be very hurt for a very long time. Yeah. Fair. But, you know. Fair. It's going to it's going to be something to I, deal with for sure. I would like to mention to anybody horrified by that like scientific study. Yes, they tested on animals. Yes, that's horrible, but at the same time, uh, they took they took their they did their due diligence and they sedated the dogs. They were un, they were like unconscious and what's the uh, painkiller? What's the what's the term for that? Mm, don't uh, remember. Sedated. Sedate. Uh, yeah, sedated. I guess is the right term. Those dogs that died didn't feel pain. Those dogs that survived also didn't feel pain. Horrible, horrible, horrible thing, but also necessary research to be done before sending people into space. It's it's unfortunate, of course, but mm-hmm. it's kind of a yeah, there's there's a constant ethical dilemma when it comes to pushing boundaries. That is something that we as a society need to grapple with. Yeah. Yeah. So we leave you this week right in the middle of a climax. How's uh, how's it feel? It feels like the end of Golden Sun. <laughs> um, it resparks my hatreds way. for you no it's i'm excited i'm always excited to keep reading i i envy any of our listeners that get to experience this without having to take breaks like i am but ultimately i'm really appreciative of the care that you take to choose endpoints and start points for this show to make for the best possible conversations so ultimately i'm understanding and fine with it despite how mad i am that's that's fair (laughs) what's uh what's really interesting is this is actually the first of three episodes in part two i lied to you you Um, did so you did lie to me yes so this is going to be next next bit that we're tackling is going to be fairly interesting before we get to that let's do your predictions okay so pj's predictions now that we know mustang is live what comes next with their relationship i think it's going to be very 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 delicate and slow and um just for everyone's safety both hers and theirs it's going to be cold and kind of emotionless conversation to start to 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 begin discourse between them and i think it has to be okay so second question what do they do now that they have quicksilver daxo and cavax um daxo and cavax i don't i don't see i don't see them being problems i think it'll i think it'll be them ultimately joining darrow maybe not in the same sort of capacity as the howlers or any of the other sons of Ares, but i think they'll they'll become assets to the sons sure and i think what they'll about? be let alone or let let go pretty pretty quickly as far as quicksilver goes i don't know if the sons will stoop down to torture i don't know if they'll need to um i I think that's on the table but i think quicksilver will be used as a means of gaining information on the jackals operations Hmm. yeah that makes sense to me okay well cool anything else nope nope I, i feel like we uh we covered a lot this this episode so all told next week we will be reading chapter 20 chapters 20 through 27 the second of three parts of part two rage so this is going to be kind of the middle chunk the week following this is going to be short stop before reading 28 correct we do read 20 correct read through 27 so i keep saying that and i keep pointing this out because when we first started recording, there was, was so much until. confusing. Was read until. Like, there, there was so much confusion. Because you said read until, but you'd always say read through out loud. So I was always fucked up, and I'd sometimes read mm-hmm. ahead and sometimes not read enough. And I'd have to, like, stop five minutes before recording and read the last chapter. So mm-hmm. I, I'm i sorry if this gets annoying for any of the listeners. I do like clarifying exactly what to read. <laughs> No, it's 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 because good. I've been traumatized by Crossland. No, oh, so so badly by Pierce mm. Brown. You mean? Mm, mm, no, you're the one that's choosing where to read to. Fair, 
fine. <laughs> so that's where we'll leave you for this week. Continue to grow and refer us to any of your friends and family or anyone that you know loves this book series. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us anywhere. We're now on YouTube, finally. We after are. After all of our various bits. Uh, currently in the process of figuring out why uh, YouTube does not like me trying to construct playlists on it. Hmm. But every episode is currently transcribed. We are up to date and they will all they should all be going forward automatically published on Thursdays automatically pushed. So very exciting. Very new. But leave us a review. Subscribe. Look there anywhere. Anywhere that you like and love us. Comment. Interact. Send us an email. Yeah. Feel free. Words and whiskey dot show is our website. And words whiskey pod on Twitter and Instagram are the uh, the two the three I guess best places to interact with us. Always always a treat to interact with the listener. Um, do we plug the next thing that we're going to be doing? Next thing we're yeah, going to be recording. I, I I mean we may as well, right? We might as well. So yeah. So, so this upcoming week we're going to be recording a podcast. Who would have thought? Not the not the same podcast you'd think. <laughs> So high key obsessed, which is at high key underscore obsessed on Instagram, I think. Yes. Yes. High key underscore obsessed is a podcast that we will be featured on. We're going to be recording it this week. I'm not entirely sure when, when that will get released. We'll make sure to keep you posted on all that. But uh, it's just mostly going to be me and Crossland talking about the, the shit that keeps us friends and that we're collectively <laughs> obsessed about. So yep. it's going to be a ton of fun. I'm super excited for it. So keeps us friends as though we wouldn't be friends if media didn't exist. You bastard. No, I, I mean, just in general, like there <laughs> no. are things that we are both obsessed about that I feel like strengthen our friendship. I'm not saying we Very wouldn't true. be friends, period, but Fine. maybe we wouldn't. Maybe we'd be, I don't know, acquaintances or something. Totally. totally. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> fascinating and uh you're dumb and i hate you no it, it's it's going to be a great podcast we're very excited to we are. Uh, be we're... talking with uh tom thomas and it's it's going to be a good time it will be crossland i don't think we've talked about this mm -hmm. are we going to be drinking during that podcast i'm planning on it okay do we want to uh create some some themed out cocktails may as well yeah i think we should maybe pineapple driven pineapple driven all right yeah because i mean his logo is a pineapple his so logo is a pineapple that's a good point i think, I think it sounds like a great idea okay Perfect. All let's right. do it you heard it here first or folks. maybe second depending on when, how quickly he turns those up that's fair okay <laughs> so with that thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next week absolutely love you all